This is the Bell X-2 rocket plane. What is its place in aviation history? Was it a success or a failure? Let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. The Bell X-2 flew in the early and mid-1950s. We're going to look at the significant flights of the airplane and the quest for supersonic flight. In 1946, this airplane made its first flight, the Republic F-84 Thunderjet. Also in 1946, this airplane first flew the de Havilland DH-108 Swallow in Great Britain. A year later, in 1947, the Bell X-1 became the first airplane to achieve supersonic flight, flown by Captain Chuck Yeager on October 14, 1947. But during this time period, there was a contract uh, that was awarded to the Bell Aircraft Company for an even more advanced airplane that uh, ultimately would achieve Mach 3. And this was part of the family of all the exotic X-planes that were flying at that time. But the Bell X-2 took form at the Bell Wheatfield, New York plant near Niagara Falls in 1950. It was a very exotic swept wing airplane and the most advanced machine ever to take to the skies at that time. On November 11th, 1950, it was rolled out of the factory on its custom uh, ground handling dolly that you see here. And boy, I'll tell you, for a, a design that took, first uh, took shape in the late 1940s, this was really a, a look at the future. The first airplane, uh, tail number 674, uh, remained at the Bell plant and was fitted with an engine uh, for ground static tests, while this airplane, 675, uh, was shipped out to the Muroc Test Center, uh, just, just recently renamed Edwards Air Force Base in California. Uh, it was a very exotic airplane built out of k Manel alloy uh, on the fuselage for uh, heat absorption and stainless steel on the wings and tailplanes. It was the first airplane ever built with a heat resistant airframe. The captive flight delivering the airplane to Edwards took place on April 22nd, 1952 with an Air Force EB-50 modified uh, mothership. And here's the airplane touching down at Edwards, south base, beautiful crosswind landing. Look at the left uh, main gear touching the runway. Here we see the airplane out on the lake bed for ground uh, handling tests. Uh, it's uh, got a photo calibration marking on the fuselage, that diamond shape with the line there. That's used for uh, the chase plane photos and calibrating the airplane's position. The cockpit was relatively Spartan. It had miniaturized instruments that were made specifically for the airplane. And you notice the Mach meter uh, only goes to Mach 1. And this was the panel as seen in the early glide flights and the first powered flights. But here's uh, ship 675 on the ground handling dolly. And as I said, for, for early 1950s, this was a very exotic, very futuristic uh, aircraft. This is a unique photo. It's the only photo of 675 taken with the other X-planes, the XF-92A uh, from left, the uh, swing wing X-5, straight wing Sky Street, swept wing Douglas Sky Rocket, and at bottom, the Northrop X-4 Bantam. Close up of the X-2 on its uh, ground handling dolly. And the first actual flight occurred June 27th. First glide flight made by Bell test pilot Skip Ziegler in ship 675. Here's the airplane taking off into the morning light. Uh, it was a relatively uneventful flight. Airplane climbed to 25,000 feet. Uh, Ziegler entered the cockpit and made a very successful flight, uh, commented uh, quite favorably on the aircraft's handling. And all went well. The airplane touched down on the uh, runway called the Navajo Trail at the south end of Rogers Dry Lake. And everything was fine until the nose wheel touched down. And at that point, all hell broke loose. The nose wheel collapsed and the airplane uh, semi ground looped and wound up in this attitude at the end of the ground roll. You can see the tire track there on the lake bed. So not a, not a totally successful uh, auspicious beginning to the airplane's career. And here's the reason why. The airplane sat very high up on its main landing skid, uh, a, a negative seven degree deck angle. And you see the nose wheel up front there. Uh, and this uh, created a very high center of gravity. And there were a number of uh, near, uh, the airplane almost overturned on one of Everest flights, but uh, uh, we're gonna see with the Air Force, 
we're going to see uh, later on how this problem was solved. And there's Pete Everest in the, in the cockpit. That's uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frank K. Pete Everest, who was the chief project pilot for the airplane for the Air Force. In the middle is Stan Smith, Bell program manager. And on the right is Skip Ziegler. Ziegler and uh, the first airplane returned back to the Bell plant uh, in uh, late 1952. Uh, the, air, the landing gear was redesigned and the uh, engine was fitted to uh, ship 675. During a pressurization test over Lake Ontario, uh, tragedy struck and the airplane exploded as they were pressurizing the fuel system. It created a, quite a bit of damage to the B-50 and sadly, uh, Skip Ziegler and Bell crewman Frank Walco were lost over Lake Ontario. This is a close-up of uh, just some of the damage to the mothership. They were able to get the airplane back to the Bell plant but it never flew again. It was written off Air Force inventory. A year later, the second airplane, or the first one built, 674, uh, was delivered to Edwards on July 15th, 1954. And here's a picture of it on South Base being demated. You'll notice the unique uh, mothership mating and demating system, which was a, a series of three elevators that rose out of the ground. And uh, oddly enough, these three elevators are still there. It's now a parking lot at South Base uh, for the test facility there, but uh, you can see the elevators in the ground. You can even see the remnants of the yellow guide stripes that you see here in this photo. Close up of the airplane showing the wiring taped up for the ferry flight and a nice study on the dolly as we see the hangars in the background. And here we see uh, 674 on the lake bed and this was the uh, example of how the landing problems were solved. They lowered the skid, widened the shoe uh, footprint, as it were, and added wing skids uh, mid-span. And this uh, created uh, a series of successful landings, and the airplane was moving forward in its flight test program. I chose Flight 7 as a significant flight, October 25th, 1955. It was the final glide flight flown by the Air Force. And it was a success in every sense of the word. Pete Evers took the airplane up. Uh, they pressurized the fuel system, although they did not ignite the engine. And uh, he uh, made a successful glide flight you see here on high approach. Uh, this photo was taken from the T-33 uh, chase plane that had a, uh, carried a photographer in the rear seat. There were a number of other chase planes, including F-94 Starfires and other uh, T-33s as well. Here's the final approach as it's, uh, Pete is crossing the edge of the lake bed. You see the uh, flaps deployed and it was a very successful ending to the glide phase and getting ready for the beginning of the powered flights. First powered flight, number eight in the program took place on November 18th, 1955. Prior to that, the airplane had been ground tested in a special revetment at South Base and this is still there as well. If you are able to visit the base, you can still see the remnants of that clay wall and the buildings that you see in this photo. Well, here's a picture of the takeoff and you notice that the B-50 is now carrying modifications for the powered flight, uh, specifically uh, the tubes that vented the uh, LOX propellants and the turbo compressor uh, steam. And here we see the moment of separation at Everest, as Everest drops away from the mothership. This beautiful photo taken from a remote wingtip camera shows the Antelope Valley. Uh, those are alfalfa fields at upper left. You see the edge of uh, Rogers Dry Lake at upper right. Beautiful photo. My painting of this uh, moment in time shows Everest uh, with a stuck right wing skid. And this uh, caused him to change the landing pattern. And so here he is banking uh, to prepare a closed left-hand pattern for a north facing landing on the lake bed which had uh, more room in case of the airplane ground loop which it didn't thankfully but the flight was successful with the exception of a small fire that uh, broke out at the uh, base of the vertical stabilizer and you see here a small hole burned in the skin on the trailing edge but this was repaired and the uh, exhaust was modified as we'll see in a moment on flight 10 uh, Pete Evers made the first supersonic flight of the airplane, April 25th, 1956. And here we see him inspecting the tail after that flight. And now you see a successful landing on the lake bed and some slight modifications to the venting system uh, and the exhaust ports of the XLR25 engine. Here's a close-up of that power plant. It's built by Reaction Motors. 
the upper chamber produced 5,000 pounds of thrust, the lower chamber 10,000 pounds of thrust, and the engine was controlled by a throttle, the first time that had ever been done in a rocket-powered airplane. Here's a close-up of another modification. These are the, what they call the rocket extenders. These were exhaust nozzles, nozzles that were fitted uh, to the uh, uh, trailing edge of the fuselage and produced additional thrust and a little more control of the engine. Flight number 16 was uh, Pete Everest's last flight in the airplane and an all-out speed attempt on July 23rd, 1956. Here we see the mating process for that flight, the X-2 being rolled into position under the bomber. Bomber lowered, in, lowered into place with the X-2 mated and you see the snubbers and uh, braces that keep the airplane from swaying inside the uh, bomber on its cruise to launch altitude. Here we see the turbo compressor exhaust. That's the uh, uh, compressor for the fuel pump and uh, propellants are being pressurized at this point. And here's a unique photo from the nose of the bomber as the X-2 rockets away. A few seconds later, it's climbing into the stratosphere. This is a uh, view from the upper window uh, of the cockpit of the mothership. Uh, Pete took the airplane out to Mach 2.87, the fastest that anyone had ever flown, and he became the fastest man alive. That was also the title of his uh, book that came out about a year later. Here's the airplane on the lake bed. You notice that it's got some stripes on the leading edges of the vertical fin, the nose, and also on the wing. And these were Templac lacquer, temper, temperature sensitive paint uh, that could study the heat propagation on the airframe. You also see the rocket extenders and the canopy uh, lying on the lake bed. In late August of 56, uh, Pete Everest moved on to a staff position in the Pentagon. And these were the two pilots that were assigned to the X-2 program uh, Captain Ivan Kinchlow on the ladder, Captain Mel Apt in the cockpit, and these two fine airmen took the airplane into the history books. Kinchlow was first, and he had a series of very frustrating uh, aborts, both in flight, uh, taxiing out for takeoff, any number of problems. And so he uh, nicknamed the airplane Hogan, which was for Hogan's goat, which was a cartoon character of a very uh, problematic uh, goat that was always getting into trouble. And that was... Uh, expressing his, his frustration with the airplane. But uh, before we take a look at the successful flight that he had, uh, here's a, a view of the total amount of ground equipment, the mothership, the rescue helicopter, all the, the support vehicles, uh, the ground crew, uh, the flight crew, the bell trucks, chase planes, uh, to give you an idea of the extensive amount of effort that went into each and every flight of the X-2. And at this stage, I'd like to introduce another gentleman, the pilot of the mothership, Captain uh, Fitz Fulton. He distinguished himself flying the, uh, the drop flights for these airplanes, later went on to uh, a tremendous career flying the XB-70 and the uh, shuttle carrier 747 in later uh, years. I should mention that I have a video on Fitz Fulton's career. The link is in the title block below, if you haven't seen that already, and it really gives a, a good story on uh, his uh, incredible career as an Air Force pilot. Flight number 19, September 7th, 1956, a max altitude flight uh, flown by uh, Ivan Kinchlow. And here's uh, Kinch before he suited up and got in the bomber. This is the bomber crew posing for a photo. And I should mention that uh, we see uh, Captain Kinchlow here in the nose of the bomber. The X-2 pilots rode to altitude in the nose of the mothership and did not enter the uh, X-2 until they were well above uh, 10 to 15,000 feet in the event of a uh, bailout. Well, he had a successful uh, flight and took the X-2 to a record altitude of 126,200 feet, the first time that an airplane had ever flown above the Earth's measurable atmosphere. And in so doing, he was nicknamed first of the spacemen. If you look at the uh, international insignia on the lower right wing, you notice it's missing its red stripes. And this was proven with chase plane photos. This was uh, very simple. The airplane was being prepared uh, for delivery to NACA uh, for its test program. And uh, they had repainted the airplane after a number of the high-speed flights because the paint had melted off. And they simply ran out of time and didn't paint the bars on the lower wing, thinking that no one would ever see it. 
Flight 20, September 27th, 1956, was the first flight in the airplane for Captain Mel Apt and was going to be a speed flight because Mel had uh, had not flown a rocket powered airplane before and they did not anticipate that he would uh, achieve the performance that he did on this flight. But early in the morning on the 27th, uh, 33,500 feet over Rosamond, California, heading into the morning sun, uh, Mel Apt launched in the airplane and flew a perfect profile. In addition to that, he had an additional 12 seconds of uh, propellant burn, which, uh, per, which pushed him to a record speed of Mach 3.2, the first time that anyone had ever flown three times the speed of sound. He uh, had achieved that speed at uh, 60,000 feet for 26 seconds of stable flight. And as he turned back to the base, the airplane tumbled out of control, went into inertia coupling, uh, which uh, was just a very tragic ending to this record flight. The escape system for the X-2 uh, was a nose capsule that jettisoned away from the main fuselage. And uh, here you see the rear uh, aft section of that with the drogue chute deployed. The idea being that the capsule would separate from the airplane, protect the pilot. He would then uh, jettison the canopy and step over the side and manually open a parachute uh, to a landing. Sadly, Mel uh, Apt ran out of altitude and was lost uh, on the impact on the desert. The main body of the airplane uh, came down in a series of glides and stalls and impacted uh, just east of Highway 395. The capsule uh, landed about five miles away. A tragic ending uh, and the 20th flight of the program. Uh, and as I said, the first flight to Mach 3, but the end of a valiant attempt at exploring the unknown. But let's look at the number of flights of the airplane. Again, we have the Douglas Skyrocket, 141 flights, uh, X-1, 151 flights, the X-15, almost 200 flights, and the X-2 at 20 flights between 1952 and 1956. So how does history judge the airplane? There were accomplishments and there were tragedies, but it provided the critical link between the X-1, or I should say the advanced X-1A that you see here, which flew at Mach 2.44, and the North American X-15, which achieved an ultimate speed of Mach 6.7, the first airplane to reach the hypersonic regime. The accomplishments of the X-2, first flights outside the Earth's atmosphere, first flight to Mach 3, first rocket engine controlled by a throttle, first heat-resistant airframe, significant steps in aviation history. But I want to close with uh, a tribute to uh, two pilots who were lost in this airplane, uh, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr., the son of the, uh, the founder of the company, who uh, was lost in the airplane trying to achieve supersonic flight on September 27th, 1946. With the X-2, Mel Apt was launched on September 27th, 1956, just one of the many coincidences in aviation history. And there you have it, a look at the X-2 and its place in aviation history. Special thanks to the uh, wonderful folks who uh, provided all the information and uh, imagery that you saw in this video. My, my great appreciation uh, for that. And I thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.